Using the power of the internet, you can now watch GLC on any TV in the US, Canada, the UK, and Ireland with Roku. Basically, a box that connects to your television. Roku acts as a middleman between your internet connection and your television. So if you have internet service at your home, chances are high that you can watch all of the great GLC programming. And best of all, it's highly affordable too, with only a one-time fee ranging from $50 to $100. Log on to our website, www.glc.us.com, for details on how you can watch GLC via Roku. Gone and welcome to Monday's update, update news. <laughs> yep. It's been an interesting day today. Before we get going too far, I want to tell you that we had uh, Shiloh, a, a GLC special guest, yeah. Shiloh Harris. He was wounded in Iraq in a really bad way. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, we did a Light of the Southwest hour with him that will air Tuesday night, tomorrow night, and um, the second hour of that will be Gary Bird with Sergeant Rock, who was okay. also injured. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it'll be a very interesting program, yes, and you don't want to miss it. Sure. Shiloh has just released a book yes. called Steel Will, mm-hmm. and it's, it's his story, of, and it's so well written. It's his story of going to Iraq being injured. He went to Iraq because of 9-11. Mm-hmm. He was defending me mm-hmm. and you, mm-hmm. you know? So anyway, Absolutely. it was great. It was great to have him on the couch today. And there you are. All right. I believe that tonight's Light of the Southwest is Snowman Powers and Alaconia. I can't think of her last name and I know her. Oh, well. Anyway, tune in tonight. That's a great, great program. Great program. You got a letter? Got a letter. It starts off, thank you so much for bringing the truth to the world. We love your programs. Our prayers are with you. And God's blessings. Butch and Donna from Tiburon, New Mexico. Well, thank you. You know what, I have to tell everybody that as I was pulling into the station grounds this morning, I really felt such a spiritual oppression over this place. It was just unbelievable. Hmm. And I went, all right, well, looks like we're going to war today. (laughs) And I walked in and sure enough, it had hit. Hmm. So we did some ministering. We did some talking. Get your eyes focus see if the if the enemy can distract us or get us in fear in Mm -hmm. any way shape or form then we lose Mm -hmm. because we're not fighting him Mm -hmm. anymore that's right so there you are and your devotion mother dear well it's from uh david wilkerson and it's called what are you looking for in a church maybe you're looking for a church that'll teach your children on sunday mornings or perhaps you're looking for true fellowship Maybe you're hungry for good praise and worship, or you're trying to meet some other deep need in your life. Let me give you this word about God's true church. The Bible says you have been appointed as a royal priest unto the Lord. That's right. You are to be a shepherd, a minister, a priest. And the true church is to originate in your home. The Bible says every believer has been called to a godly Zadok priesthood. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge." You do not have to go to Bible school or have an ordination paper hanging on your wall in order to be part of God's royal priesthood. Everyone who has been washed in the blood of Jesus has been raised up as a priest unto the Lord. And David says, he grew up in a family that observed what used to be called the family altar. His father believed that the verses 
in Hebrews commanding Christians not to forsake corporate assembly was meant for families as well. Therefore, they were not to miss the family altar. He says, if my siblings and I were out playing with our friends when it came time for family altar, we always came in when our parents called out, prayer time. Everyone in the neighborhood knew the Wilkerson's were going to the altar. My father happily took on the role of priest and shepherd in our home. But what about you? Have you searched your heart about being a priest to your family? Okay, well, I totally agree that we are all to behave as priests in our homes. I am going to disagree with what he had to say there, that we're, we are called to be a godly Zadok priesthood because of what he quoted here, yeah. which is Ezekiel. He is talking specifically to the, the priest, priest. Mm-hmm. the Levites, the son of Zadok. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That yes. never changed. That's right. That is them and them alone who get to minister to the Lord in that way. Well, that was in the temple or mm-hmm. in the tabernacle, yeah. But we are, like Shabbat, is to be a home service, you know? It's a is to bring the family together for, mm-hmm. for home. Keep those Well, we got some lines. not good news last week, but we got more news about it today. So we're going to share that with you, even though this is probably news everywhere. She's a Texan. We're talking about it. The Texas nurse who contracted Ebola while caring for the first person to die of the virus in the U.S. has been identified as 26-year-old Nina Pham. Health officials have not released the nurse's name, but Yahoo News identified Pham through public records and a state nursing database. On Monday, Pham's family confirmed to her, her identity to local Dallas ABC News affiliate WFAA. The Dallas resident is a 2010 graduate of Texas Christian University and has been a nurse since June 2010, according to state records. Pham, a critical care nurse at Texas Health Presbyterian Dallas, is one of at least 50 people who cared for Thomas Eric Duncan before he passed away last Wednesday. Pham has been in isolation since late Friday. The CDC confirmed her Ebola diagnosis on Sunday. It's the first time the deadly virus has been transmitted in the United States. CDC Director Dr. Thomas Frieden said Pham is in stable condition at Texas Health Presbyterian. An unidentified person Pham had close contact with last week is also in isolation at the hospital, but Bryden said that that individual has not yet become ill. Investigators have not determined how Pham specifically contracted the disease from Duncan, who died on his 10th day of intensive care at Texas Health Presbyterian. If this one individual was infected, and we don't know how, within the isolation unit, then it's possible that other individuals could have been infected as well, Frieden said during a press conference. We consider them to be at risk, and we are doing an in-depth review and investigation. It's good to know that they're doing that. Well, this is from AP, comes from Cairo. Delegates representing some 50 nations and 20 regional and international organizations came together on Sunday in Cairo, uh, for, and that's in Egypt, for a one-day conference on the reconstruction of Gaza. President of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, said Gaza needs $4 billion to rebuild after the war between Hamas and Israel this summer. Secretary of State John Kerry pledged $212 million in American assistance. United Arab Emirates promised $200 million, and Qatar pledged $1 billion, once again using its vast wealth to reinforce its role as a regional player. While many of the delegates applauded the pledge by Qatar, a tiny but energy-rich Gulf Arab nation, the Emirates, like regional heavyweight Saudi Arabia, alleges that Qatar uses its massive wealth to undermine regional stability, primarily through meddling in other nations' affairs and aiding militant Islamic groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and Gaza's Hamas. The Muslim Brotherhood, the Arab world's oldest Islamic group with branches across much of the region, has been branded a terrorist organization by Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Syria, Russia, and Bahrain. The Brotherhood has close ties to Hamas in the Gaza Strip, which borders Egypt and Israel. 
Both countries have blockaded Gaza since Hamas took power there in 2007, causing the territory of 1.8 million people economic hardships and high unemployment. In a move that strained relations with Egypt following the ouster of Islamic President and Brotherhood member Mahmoud Morsi, Mohammed Morsi, in July 2013, Qatar hosted members and leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood were, who were exiled from Egypt. Just last month, after much political pressure, Qatari authorities gave Muslim Brotherhood leaders one month to leave the country. Organizers of the Cairo Conference hope the pledges will be paid over the period of three years to aid construction in the Gaza Strip. Donors plan to funnel the aid through Abbas's Palestinian Authority and bypass Hamas. Abbas and Hamas formed a national unity government earlier this year, but despite the handover, Hamas has remained the de facto power in Gaza, with moves to implement the provisions of the unity agreement put on hold. The new cabinet, which took office on June 2nd, held its first cabinet meeting in Gaza just last week. Oh, well, we gotta get those tunnels rebuilt. Well, this comes from uh, Reuters. Um, the U.S. military faces a new kind of threat with Ebola. At Fort Campbell in Kentucky, spouses of U.S. soldiers headed to Liberia seem to be lingering just a bit longer than, pre, than usual after pre-deployment briefings, hungry for information about Ebola. For these families, the virus is raising a different kind of anxiety than the one they have weathered during 13 years of ground war in Afghanistan and Iraq. They want to know how the military can keep soldiers safe from the epidemic, a new addition to the Army's long list of threats. Ebola is a different problem set that the division hasn't faced before, said Major General uh, Gary Voleski, who will soon head to Liberia along with soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division. There are already more than 350 U.S. troops on the ground in West Africa, mostly in Liberia, including a handful from the 101st. That number is set to grow exponentially in the coming weeks as the military races to expand Liberia's infrastructure so it can battle Ebola. The military has already put up a headquarters in Liberia's capital, Monrovia, and hopes to have a 25-bed field hospital up and running by the middle of this month. It also aims to quickly build up the 17 Ebola treatment units. The message at Fort Campbell and at American military bases elsewhere is that the threat from Ebola is manageable. With the right precautions, the risk is low. U.S. soldiers certainly will not be treating sick Liberians, and if all goes according to plan, they will not interact with them either. But there is still concern among military families. That is something U.S. forces on the ground say they are wrestling with, even as they report freely relatively safe from infection. The hemorrhagic fever, which has no proven cure, has killed more than 4,000 people in West Africa since an outbreak that began in March. More than half the dead have been in Liberia, where the health care system is still reeling from a devastating 1989 to 2003 civil war. The risk of failing to contain Ebola in West Africa have come into sharp focus in the U.S. after the first patient diagnosed with the disease on U.S. soil, Thomas Eric Duncan, died. As the Ebola threat evolves, the Pentagon has acknowledged the size and duration of the mission in West Africa could too. Deployments might even top the current projection of nearly 4,000, an increase from an earlier estimate of around 3,000. To operate safely in Monrovia and beyond, the Army is giving soldiers safety training, including a course for 150 soldiers on Thursday at Fort Campbell. The group of soldiers carefully listened to instructors from the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, who spelled out the dangers of Ebola, which kills nearly half of the people in, in, it infects. Captain Alex Willard, who was undergoing the training, said the West Africa mission was far different from the kinds of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan that many of the 101st probably are more comfortable with. And then an article from Politico. Ladies, listen up. Ebola is threatening much of the world's chocolate supply, which comes from a country surrounded 
by the Ebola outbreak. Ivory Coast, the world's largest producer of cacao, the raw ingredient in M&M's, Butterfingers, and Snicker bars, closed its borders in August to Guinea and Liberia, putting a major cramp on the workforce needed to pick up the beans just as the harvest season begins. The West African nation of about 20 million, also known as Côte d'Ivoire, has yet to experience a single case of Ebola, but the outbreak could raise prices. Ivory Coast produces roughly 33% of the world's total cacao beans. Another 15% comes from the world's third largest producer, Ghana, which is situated right next to Ivory Coast. Tim McCoy, a senior advisor for the World Cocoa Foundation, said signs that Ivory Coast residents are already concerned were immediately obvious during his last trip to the country in September. Going into meetings where you always shake hands and oftentimes with young men and women, you do the cheek kiss thing. They weren't doing that, McCoy said. The market is worried too. Prices on, on cocoa futures jumped from their normal trading range of $2,000 to $2,700 per ton to as high as $3,400 in September over concerns that the spread of Ebola uh, to Côte d'Ivoire right now, price per ton is about $3,100 a ton. The, the WCF is working now to collect large donations from Nestle's, Mars, and many of its 113 other members for its cocoa industry response to Ebola initiative. The initiative hasn't been publicly unveiled, but the WCF plans to announce details on Wednesday during its annual meeting in Copenhagen, Denmark, on how the money will fuel Red Cross and Caritas Internationales work to help the infected and staunch Ebola's spread. Wow. Well, this article is from Reuters. Members of an NBC News crew who worked with a cameraman who contracted Ebola in Liberia have been quarantined, New Jersey health officials said on the Saturday. The NBC News crew had agreed with health officials to stay in their homes after returning to the United States, but then failed to do so. Mm -hmm. Donna uh, Lesnar, a spokeswoman for the New Jersey Department of Health said in a statement, the man mandatory quarantine will ensure the group remains confined until October 22nd the end of a 21-day maximum incubation period, for Ebola, Lesnar said. The NBC crew remains symptom-free, so there's no reason for concern of exposure to the community, she said. NBC News has reported that the crew that worked with Mukopo uh, included its medical correspondent, Dr. Nancy Snyderman. The spokeswoman declined to provide additional details about the crew, its size, and the specific reasons behind the mandatory order, citing patient privacy. Officials said the order was issued late Friday after the crew members violated an agreement to voluntarily confine themselves. They said none of the team has exhibited symptoms of the often fatal disease since returning from Liberia, one of the three West African countries at the ep epicenter of the outbreak. Meanwhile, the condition of the freelance American cameraman continued to improve. At Nebraska Medical Center, Asha Komukpo, 33, has received an experimental drug and a blood transfusion from Dr. Kent Brantley, who earlier recovered from a bout with Ebola at Emory Ho University Hospital in Atlanta. Brantley also contracted the disease in Liberia. Mukpo is eating some solid food now, so we're still headed in the right direction, said Dr. Phil Smith, director of the biocontainment unit at Nebraska Medical Center. The death this week of the first person diagnosed with Ebola in the U.S. has increased fears that the disease could spread outside West Africa, where it's killed more than 4,000 people. U.S. health authorities are stepping up efforts to stop the spread of the deadly virus. Medical teams at New York's JFK Airport armed with Ebola questionnaires and temperature guns, began screening passengers who traveled from the three countries most affected. Well, this article comes from Times of Israel. Scientists around the world are scrambling to find a treatment for Ebola and are looking to the tobacco plant for assistance as a vehicle to synthesize antibodies for a vaccine. 
and that means they are likely to be looking towards Israel's coal plant, a company that is a pioneer in the development of recombinant proteins using tobacco plants. While coal plant is not involved with the development of ZMAP, the tobacco synthesized cocktail being developed by several American companies that so far is the only Ebola treatment on the horizon. The Israeli company knows a great deal about large-scale production of human cells in tobacco plants, said Professor Oded Shosesyov, uh, founder and chief scientist, scientific officer of coal plant. We were the first company in the world to use tobacco plants to do large-scale manufacturing of human proteins and to receive EU permission to market tobacco-synthesized human elements, he told the Times of Israel in an interview. ZMAP is composed of three humanized monoclonal antibodies manufactured in plants, specifically nicotinia. It is an optimized cocktail combining the best components of three antibodies. The antibodies bind to proteins on the Ebola virus, which triggers the immune system and destroys the germ. ZMAC, according to its makers, was first identified as a possible treatment last January. It has since been used on several Ebola victims in Liberia with mixed results. It's been administered to about half a dozen patients, with most surviving. Although tests on animals have shown positive results, ZMAP has not been clinically tested on humans. Nevertheless, ZMAP is the world's best bet for an Ebola treatment, at least right now. The problem is there are not enough doses to conduct clinical trials or to treat patients for that matter. Production is being handled by a company called Kentucky Bioprocessing, KBP, which has been using tobacco plants to synthesize ZMAP. Tobacco plants are injected with Ebola virus and fused with genes for a natural tobacco virus. The plant then responds, producing antibodies to fight the virus. The antibodies are extracted and injected in Ebola victims, hopefully curing them. It was coal plant that pioneered the mass production of human materials in tobacco plants. We didn't invent the method, but we have taken it farther than anyone else, said Soshin Yov. That's pretty cool. You know, with the whole world turning against Israel, I think it would be really great for crying, yeah. a company there to come up with a cure for Ebola. Wouldn't it? And then we could all wear their Levi jeans. <laughs> oh, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? He does. Well, this comes from uh, the AFP, and, and this is about the Boston bomber. A, new, a United States judge postponed the trial of alleged Boston bomber uh, Zokhar Zarnev by two months to January 5th. Judge George O'Toole, however, rejected requests by defense lawyers for the trial to be moved from Boston on the grounds that the 21-year-old would not be able to have a fair, fair hearing. Zarnev's trial had been due to get underway in November. Zarnev is accused of being one of the masterminds of the twin bombings at the finish line of the Boston Marathon on April 15, 2013. The attack killed three people and injured 264. Authorities said the ethnic Chechen uh, Czech carried out the bombing with his older brother uh, Tamerlan, who was killed during a police manhunt while the pair were on the run. You know, I started uh, to read an article Friday that we didn't have quite time to finish. And that was about a gal who is serving an 86-year sentence in a medical prison here in Texas. What I really want to point out to people about that article is her attorneys that, you know we're paying for them, mm -hmm. her five attorneys, sure. are trying to claim that, um, you know, we, we must force her to file this appeal because if we don't, well, she doesn't understand that this is her last chance. She clearly understood, and the judge ruled, no, we're done, okay? Mm -hmm. What's really interesting about this is the gal's mega smart. She went to MIT. I think she can probably understand the appeal process. Yeah. But the biggest thing about this 
is that the Islamic State specifically was in negotiations with the U.S. government trying to get her freedom. And one of the foreign hostages in that trade deal was guess who? James Foley. James Foley. And, well, we all know he was beheaded because they didn't get their way. Mm Mm-hmm. So isn't that interesting? It really is. It, it, all together, it, it makes me furious that we're paying for her lawyers. And we are paying for her lawyers. And then insisting that she, we continue in the process. Mm-hmm. We're also paying for her imprisonment and her medical care. Mm-hmm. She sure. actually, what happened was, this was, I believe, in Afghanistan. They were coming to talk to her, and there was a team of them that were coming to talk to her. And uh, she pulled a gun on them, and she got shot instead. So that attempted murder that she's serving the 86 years for is because there were so many people involved in it. Okay. Wow. Well, well, this article is from uh, Reuters out of Boston. Jury selection is set to begin on Monday for a trial of the last of three college friends of the accused Boston Marathon bomber to face charges relating to a visit the trio made to the suspect's dorm room uh, three days after the deadly attack. The trial will focus on the visit of Robel Filippos, 21, and two Kazakh exchange students made to accused bomber uh, Zohar Zarnev's room at the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth on April 18, 2013, after the FBI released photos of Zarnev and his older brother identifying them as suspects in the bombing that killed three people and injured more than 260. The two exchange students were found guilty and pleaded guilty to charges of obstruction of justice for taking a backpack containing empty firework shells from the room and tossing it into a dumpster by their apartment. Filippo, a U.S. citizen and resident of Cambridge, Massachusetts, faces a lesser charge, that of lying to investigators, with prosecutors contending he initially denied Sarnef's denied entering Zarnef's dorm room that night. He faces up to 16 years in prison if convicted in U.S. District Court in Boston. He's not the only person to face criminal charges for lying to investigators during the investigation, though. A Kyrgyzstan national was arrested in May and charged with lying for playing down his relationship with the Zarnev brothers after going to a local police station to say he suspected they were the bombers. It's unusual for prosecutors to level a charge of lying to investigators, said Thomas Feitch, a partner at the law firm Cohn, Kavanaugh, and former federal prosecutor. It does seem something of an overreach where the government doesn't think enough of the misstatement to make it an obstruction charge, Feitch said. The three men are not accused of playing a role in the bombing. The surviving brother, Zarnef, 21, faces the possibility of execution if he's convicted during a trial set to begin in January. Hmm. Wow. Well, I wonder if we're paying for his trial as well. Oh, probably. I wonder why all the foreign students are doing what they're doing. Well, it's very interesting that they come here, yeah. they receive their education here, and then Three. and then they turn against us. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your country is. There's a lot of people that even I have personally known that they will take and take and take and mm-hmm. take, and then they turn on you. Mm-hmm. It's human nature. Mm-hmm. If you don't want to live your life uprightly but before the God of Israel, that's what's going to happen. That's right. Guess what? We love you. We're out of time. We'll see you Wednesday. Pay- right? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.